So today I wanted to touch a little bit more about some of the really interesting aspects of biology that we don't ordinarily think about. So uh, endophytic biology can be bacteria or fungi. They live inside of the plant. Um, and if they, if the fungi was in a leaf and it was fall and that leaf fell on the ground, um, as that leaf started to decay, uh, the fungi would transfer into a sap robe and begin to consume that decaying leaf matter. If that leaf was to fall into the water, it would morph into an aquatic fungi. And then it can go full circle and enter back into the tree or plant um, as an endophyte, either through uh, a sucking or biting insect or perhaps uh, a soil interaction um, where the sap robe actually uh, united with the roots and the roots accepted uh, you know, a spore or something back into it. Again, all, not all of these processes are completely understood, but Dr. James White has been doing work on this for years, and he's got some really interesting papers out there on it. Um, I also wanted to talk about how two bacteria, uniquely different, can come together and have a horizontal gene transfer and give offspring to a whole new uh, species of bacteria in the snap of a finger. Um, so there is this incredible succession or morphology that is happening uh, below us and around us at all times. And it's really kind of eye-opening to see how quickly this succession can actually happen on a, on a microbial scale. So we did have one question and I'm going to try to bring him up on the stage now. Uh, let me see. Edit. No one has a hand up. Oh, so we lost him, whoever he was. Uh, oh, there he's up here already. All right, Thomas. Sorry, later. Um, go ahead and ask your question, my friend. Uh, introduce oh, yeah. yourself first, though, please. Oh, yeah. This is Thomas. Uh, actually, Thomas. It's a wonder how Peter always get it right. Um, my question is about you always talking about succession and you sometimes you talk about how the mass migrations have happen and they probably re inoculated uh, different areas and my question is uh maybe humans could have the job also do you, do you know any of those microorganisms maybe i don't know make, coming symbi symbiotic with the human body and then being like introduced to other places that the human could go to i i know that the human the human body is almost made like 90 percent of microbes so i was thinking about that could you please enlighten us on something like that that's a great question thomas and the answer is absolutely yes uh you know you think about uh, perhaps the early uh sailors and they would bring food and water and of course, wherever they came from, they were consuming um, specific plants, vegetables, and animals to their area. So they were a giant Petri dish as they traveled around the world, uh, not only with, with physical materials, but with their gut biome. Because every time um, they uh, emptied their, their bowels, um, that would have been an inoculant. And, you know, before manures became such a stigma and we became so antiseptic and antibacteria. Um, we were, were as a species utilizing every single thing we could, including human waste um, in agriculture. Um, and nowadays it's very much frowned upon and, and you know, for good reasons, because um, we, are, we are a pharmaceutical uh, disaster um, as a species. Uh, most of those compounds, antidepressants, um, anti-anxieties, uh, antibiotics, um, are showing up in in fish, in you know the Puget Sound, and everywhere, uh, because all of our wastewater is mixed with stormwater, uh, processed to get rid of most of the sludges, um, and then unfortunately, a lot of those are just passing right through. We had a wonderful conversation on another. Um, clubhouse last Sunday, I think it was, with uh, a Tom, a biologist friend of ours, on just this very topic of cleaning wastewater uh, for future generations and how best to, to get some of these more complex compounds out of play 
uh, either by breaking them down or absorbing them in a manner that they can then be safely transferred into uh, a place to be further composted in a way that um, we're not under such pressure to, to break the compound down. So I would say that <clears throat> everything, uh, there's a woman who did an amazing uh, study in 2018 and opened up a whole new world uh, of biology. And that's actually studying the biology associated with smoke and ash in wildfires. So she was out here studying California wildfires and quickly realized that um, on the ash and in the smoke, there was bacteria, fungi, and protozoa. So you think about the, the wildfires in Australia were, were very much uh, inoculating uh, the South America and perhaps middle America, middle part of the US or middle part of the, uh, the Americas and perhaps as far north up as here. And the same thing is true with our fires, uh, which obviously due to the prevailing wind um, and the jet stream were, were in many ways inoculating the East Coast. And you know some of this is good and some of this is bad. Obviously, particulate uh, 2.5 micron and less um, can actually cause serious lung disease because it's so small that it can get into our capillaries, um, clog them and become infected. And those infection sites then can potentially allow um, viruses to, to overtake the cells. And if your immune system isn't in harmony, uh, potentially get you very sick. So, you know, those are a couple thoughts on, on how this, this incredible biodynamic biosphere is constantly re-inoculating itself. Um, another thought is that there was a study done by NASA back in 2011 uh, that indicated that the phosphorus for the Amazon rainforest was a direct result of sandstorms in the Sahara. So the sandstorms in Sahara would shoot this stuff up into the jet stream. The jet stream would bring it across the entire ocean and it would remineralize either through uh, particle charge in the ionosphere, or perhaps um, the particles just started to, to collect and coagulate together through moisture um, or some other force, and then they would fall on the Amazon rainforest. And then to, to take it to the next level, uh, there was uh, another study done in 2018, not by NASA, but an independent, um, that basically concluded that not only did it, was it supplying the phosphorus, but it was supplying a tremendous amount of nutrients both in the form of diatomaceous earth, as well as uh, clay and, and fine sand particles. Um, so another interesting study on, on nutritional or nutri nutrients moving was a study recently done in Egypt where um, the banks of the Niles have always been the, some of the most fertile um, uh, soils in the world. Uh, there are floodplains there for thousands and thousands of years. And then all of a sudden the fertility um, started to diminish. The crops weren't growing as big and hardy and, and we're having more problems with pest pressure. So the, the Egyptian government uh, started to look at the water and what they quickly realized was that uh, upstream, they had uh, put a dam in another country had dammed up the Nile to create hydro uh, electricity. And in doing so had actually uh, accidentally stopped what's called nano clay. Um, so that would be clay that is finer than a traditional platelet. Um, a good example of it would be clay that if you put in water uh, would stay, the water would stay cloudy for more than two days. And anyway, so that clay was no longer in play. It was no longer washing up in the, on the soil and the floodplains and the spring flooding. And that was the cause the root cause of the lack of fertility so this is you know this is what the planet does and the big problem we have is that this is what we're preventing from occurring um, as a species at this point and therefore we've got to really start looking inward and finding ways to solve some of these extremely complex problems um, if we're going to continue to uh, <laughs> I hate to use the word thrive, but let's go, let's, let's worry about surviving. So, um, you know, that's, that was a great question, Thomas, and I was happy to go on that rant and, uh, Craig's here now. So I'd like Craig to open up and, and introduce himself and, uh, let's, let's chop it up tonight, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lee. Thomas. 
How's it going, everyone? Just getting back from work. This is our new position as the compost coordinator for this uh, urban farming initiative up in Harlem. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, definitely nice to have some regular hours on the train. So if you hear any kind of beeping or pushing air, that's what that is. Anyway, uh, my name is Craig Chester. My background is I'm an educator, a citizen scientist, and an applied mycologist. A lot of my background is in fungi and kind of how I. Uh, uh, Leighton here, by extension, is kind of kind of trying to kind of understand the symphony of nature, which I, is a great way to kind of understand a lot of the people in the organic, regenerative, biodynamic, um, you know, bio-intensive practices. So definitely, I'm kind of one towards. So definitely, in my perspective, is with fungi, understanding the roles they play in um, all kind of ecologies. And especially essentially from being the one of the large initiators of the nutrient cycling in our world as well. So it was kind of very apropos uh, given the fact that many of the keys to understanding these deeply dynamics are inherently fungal connections. Uh, but myself initially, whereas I began the interested in fungi and thought, you know, fungi were the answer, kind of mycocentric, fungal centric, I just realized after several years of kind of sitting in in a lot of adjacent fields that um, they are uh, their keystone, but still things. you still require all the other organisms working in unison for them to function. So that's kind of been my background. Well, that was, that was cool. Thanks, Craig. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, Craig and I and, and Life or Leaf uh, have a study group that we often talk on Friday afternoons about uh, the most recent breakthroughs and understandings in, in complex soil biological systems. And I think that that's, you know, really the biggest missing piece in, in traditional reductionist science is that we're not looking at the communities. We're looking at the individuals and trying to identify what they do. And instead of taking a broader sweep and saying, this is just a nanosecond in, in geological time that really um, that organism next time we go back to look at it very well may not be present anymore. It may have actually evolved uh, or, or horizontally transferred its DNA into a different, a different animal or a different species altogether. Um, similar to like what the cannabis plant does and, and the breeding. So recently another article that was really interesting was the understanding that um, fungi actually are a super highway for bacteria. Um, so the bacteria are moving in a liquid form along the outsides of the hyphae uh, from one plant to the other or from one group of nutrients or minerals to another. Um, so there's this an amazing symphony that's going on um, in this, this you know, relationship between these two radically different kingdoms in the biological world. Um, and more so that there's now data showing that the bacteria in some cases is actually exchanging cytoplasm with the fungi and therefore the opposite probably is true um, so that there is a horizontal gene transfer between the fungi and the bacteria and last last session we, we talked a little bit about something even more complex which is the lichen and how lichen have this relationship between um, algae and fungi and or algae and bacteria and or algae, bacteria and fungi. So we are really at a cutting edge point in, in our understanding of just how complex um, this, this biological system that allowed such incredible life uh, to evolve to a level of, of dinosaurs or elephants or giraffes or rhinos or any of these incredible super predator cats and bears so you know in unlocking some of these uh, tiny little intricacies um, you can really start to you know begin to think about you know what could possibly potentially be going on underfoot uh, another great study recently from the um I, uh, the space station was that they had put bacteria on the outside to see how it would react to certain levels of radiation. And what they discovered that after uh, a period of time, a lengthy period of time, I believe it was a couple of years, 
that when they went back and scraped off the biofilm that under in the layered within that biofilm the 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 bacteria had survived um i mean this is this is incredible to think that something can live outside of of a environment um void of oxygen and and atmosphere and gravity and exposed to incredible uv and radiation um it's just you know again staggering to think um how incredible life is and the old saying from jurassic park life finds a way um so I, you know i'd love you to chop a little bit more up on that one craig if you would be so kind yeah definitely so this is something that's pretty uh fascinating and i think i know people who are familiar with dr williams work um the soil food web which was pretty revolutionary given the fact that a lot of people who were studying soil um you know classically it was in extension geology um, trying to understand you know, the components of what type of mineral compositions led to different types of parent material uh, then understanding that there's a geochemistry um understanding the fact that you have different mineral elements different conditions these are affecting different uh redox states and affecting potential nutrient availability uh, but then you know the biggest contrib contribution that Dr. Lane was, um, you know, really pointing and paying attention to the fact that the micro ecology of the soil was there. And it wasn't just something that just, you know, you know disappeared and you know, showed up and, and then you know, there was something that was incredible. And you can also interacting with the substrate, organic or inorganic that they were living in. So it's really exciting for that. So the soil food is a great starting point to understand those notions. However, something that I've been really fascinated by is that whereas Dr. Lane organized different organisms based upon where they sit in the food chain, the trophic list, trophic just being a fancy word for eating or requiring food, uh, what's really fascinating and it gets me excited is these uh, interactions between bacteria and fungi. Um, it's, there's a number of papers that have come out in general. I think even one just this past week was actually um, conducted by uh, Laboratory in Cornell, where they basically made the connection to the fact that one of the kind of mysteries from mycorrhizal fungi for the longest time was like, okay, we've sequenced their genomes. We know they don't have any enzymes that would allow them to solubilize phosphorus. Um, but it turns out when they did studies where they were culturing these mycorrhizal fungi and plant roots, they realized they were able to sequence the, the microbial bacterial community growing uh, in unison with, with the mycorrhizal fungi. And it turns out in general that the mycorrhizal fungi are modifying the rhizosphere. That's attracting and recruiting different types of bacteria. And you can see these bacteria moving back and forth across mycorrhizal fungi hyperforms. And also, to solubilizing uh, certain uh, elements out of parent material and organic material. And what's even more amazing is that this isn't just like a single species of bacteria, this is a whole ecology. You even have different bacteria that can actually uh, hunt down and predate other types of bacteria and cause them to crack open, actually release spilling out their, their cytoplasm into the soil and potentially releasing nutrients. So, this is something that's really mind blowing. Uh, we're only beginning to understand these complexions. So, you know, what's really exciting is that people are paying attention to the soil food web, but what's really gonna be coming in is the people doing good science on these regenerative um, foundations that understand the role that microbial ecology plays. You know, like the soil food web 2.0, where we're able to map the interactions between organisms from micro to macro. Um, so it's pretty amazing. We're only kind of just at the tip of the iceberg in that example. And also kind of insert another concept about a uh, horizontal gene transfer. Uh, it happens, uh, you know, organisms are pretty closely together. Oftentimes a lot of these jumps are facilitated, not just between bacteria and fungi, but even, even between plants and insects. There was recently a paper that came out that showed that white flies White flies are actually resistant to a number of uh, a number of compounds. Uh, it basically anti anti insecticidal compounds are 
compounds that plants produce to ward off insects, prevent them from metabolizing it. Uh, I think the, the term was uh, glyco, glycosides. Yeah, glycosides. Um, so basically compounds that are, uh, that are produced in composition with sugar. So for example, like uh, saw an ECA, like your nightshades, they produce a, a notable uh, compound, which, you know, can irritate the digestive tracts of many insects to the point of killing them and also a number of humans based on allergies. And naturally the plant will make the antidote for it. It would make an enzyme that will basically break down the glycoside and protect itself. It turns out white flies some time ago, there was a virus that basically took this gene from a number of plants to break down these glycoside compounds uh, and basically infected the white fly and imported it. So this was pretty amazing. This was the first notion of you basically get a transgenetic uh, movement of a gene from the plant kingdom to the animal kingdom, which is pretty wild. There's, this is why white flies are such a notorious pest because some time ago there was this chance occurrence uh, of inheriting this gene facilitated by a virus. So it's pretty amazing given the fact that we're just beginning to understand the interaction and complexities between organisms as well. And that's just one tiny example. <laughs> um, you know, if you look at, at animals, um, a lot of interbreeding and crossbreeding had to have occurred uh, to say, get a fox or, or something else. Uh, you know, the difference between a rhino and a, and a buffalo, uh, I mean, a rhino and a uh, hippo, hippopotamus, um, you know, similar, but yet completely different. So, I, you know, that's, this has always been part of the, you know, the fascination and the drive behind um, what I do is, is, you know, again, it's, it's biology. So I'm looking at a much, much smaller scale, but it really opens your mind to um, the potential of panspermia. Now, panspermia is a theory that, that life essentially started on another planet or in another galaxy um, and was transported through either a comet or an asteroid across galaxies and, 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 you know, millions, billions of years um, and, and then we got so close to our atmosphere, which had, you know, somehow, uh, formed, um, and blew up in the, you know, in our atmosphere and released all of these organisms. Now, in the example I just talked about, um, with the biology living in, in smoke and ash, um, and the transfer of diatomaceous earth and, and nutrients from one continent to another, um, the reality is that it's, it's probably a realistic theory. Um, to and a better understanding of, of how life was created. I mean, there's been some interesting work done on um, geochemical processes where the potential for life to happen is there, but it's that finding that seed, that, that, that catalyst that allowed a biological uh, primordials or lack of biology, a primordial soup um, to actually go so far as to create a, a life force. And, you know, this is, this is something that, you know, I've, I've been a big fan of, of redefining life. Um, traditionally or, or right now we, we view as an egg as dead and a sperm as alive. Um, we view viruses as dead, although they live in every living cell. Uh, in some cases, they're way more abundant than, than actually bacteria are. And they were the prime drivers of all evolution. If something got, got out of whack, the virus stepped in and knocked it back. Now, potentially that made whatever was knocked back stronger because eventually um, it was either wiped out or it figured out how to survive or outcompete the viral uh, infection. So again, thinking about, you know, biology on a, on a, on a really, really deep scale, um, reeling it back into soil and to understanding how to take dirt and turn it into soil, you need as much diversity as you possibly can. Um, I did a whole presentation on aquatic microorganisms and how they in fact are um, compatible in, in, in an aquatic environment and, and, or you know, back in their terrestrial environment and the vice versa is true. So, um, 
we know for sure amoebas live in dry soil and they live in water um, and they're a predator. And so to think that the bacteria wouldn't would be kind of naive. And recently there have been some uh, preliminary studies indicating that potentially 80 percent of, of, you know, biological entities um, on on the micro scale. So so not multi cell, but single cells um can transfer or or adapt into um either an aquatic or a terrestrial environment so you know in in understanding you know how to again take some dirt um and and convert it into super rich soil you really have to be looking at well how best do i collect uh, my local indigenous um biological uh consortiums or or uh, communities and so, you know, that's been something that I've worked um, really hard on in the last 12 years is, is coming up with manners or methods to first compost it, um, grow out those organisms um, so that they're environmentally uh, ready for that environment, uh, or I should say prepared for that environment. Um, so obviously, you know, altitude, humidity, lack of, or more too much, um, sunshine, UV, all these things play a part in, in making sure that you're not just creating biostimulants. So a biostimulant would be like basically feeding a bacteria, another type of bacteria. And pretty much all of the, all of the products on the, on the market now that, that are, you know, basically claiming that they're a biological inoculant. We, we refer to them as bugs in the jug. Um, they're all grown in, in vitro. So they're grown in a lab under the perfect conditions with the perfect food, the perfect temperature. And when you throw them in the soil, you are basically throwing them into a very hostile environment um, that they're not prepared to deal with. Whether they actually inoculate, my instincts would tell me no, they're just a biostimulant. They're just another food source for present biology, whether it's, you know, a uh, protozoa or a predator, or perhaps they just starve out and release their cytoplasm into the soil system. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. And so um, much of the work I do is, is, you know, in educating people as to how best to do that is to start by saying, okay, what is our goal here? What are, what are we trying to actually accomplish? And obviously it's a very simple answer. We're, we're looking to build soil and soil fertility. So how do we best achieve soil fertility without diversity? Well, the answer is you really can't. And so reeling it back in and saying, all right, so how do I create that diversity? Well, the answer is to use as many different ingredients in your composting process as you possibly can. Um, when I got out here to California on March 9th, or excuse me, March 4th of 2020, um, I had no idea that I would not be driving, traveling back across the country to do my work uh, starting in, in April. And lo and behold, two days later, uh, they shut the state down. They shut pretty much the world down. And so I was trapped out here going, OK, <clears throat> um, what am I going to do? And so I immediately started saying, well, I'm going to need compost. I'm going to need, you know, need some ingredients to be able to perform my job. Um, and I'm going to run out of the little that I had with me. So I began to build compost. And the first thing I did was look at my surroundings and try to find as many different diverse greens as I could. Um, so that meant trimming the tips of every different type of plant I could get and basically, um, you know, cutting the new tender shoots, um, chopping them up to help, you know, facilitate a quicker breakdown. And then of course, start scrounging browns, any type of different sticks uh, that I could find. I stayed away from palms, obviously, because they're just so diseased. Um, but I, I was cutting grasses that were growing up in concrete because again, if they're that strong that they can survive a hostile environment like that, then they're what I would want to consider a very um, biologically active and healthy plant. Um, and so, yeah, wildflowers, succulents, uh, different types of hedging material, deciduous bushes. Um, I did do a, a little bit of um, fruiting tree uh, leaf tips, um, but that's that's how you do it. That's how you achieve um, these this collection of diversity. 
And then to touch it off, what I did was I mixed all these greens and browns together. So if you're not familiar with making compost, that's 66% browns, 33% greens. Um, I do not use high nitrogen, so that means no manures. Um, well, actually, that's not true. I do use fish manure, but I have aerobically stabilized it. Um, and it's, 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 you know, basically biology for the most part. Um, but, um, I touched it off by going to the beach and harvesting as many, uh, different types of seaweed and kelps that I could find. And I put them in a bucket about three quarters full, about five gallon bucket, uh, came home, filled it with fresh water until I could keep the plants submerged without them sitting on the bottom. And I put it in the sun and I let it ferment for seven days. Uh, and it became foamy at the top and it had a, a funky kind of uh, musk smell to it. And I microscoped it and the biological life and diversity was was insane. It was mind blowing. So I dumped that into my compost and lo and behold, uh, within a couple of days that, that went right up to 115 degrees. <clears throat> Again, if you're making biological compost, you do not want to exceed 120 degrees. Anything above that, um, the thermophytes take over and you lose diversity. And that diversity is not going to come back for, for, you know, 9, 10, 12 months. Um, so it's really important that you, you know, understand that new compost, anything that has not been cured, will not hold any biology. Uh, because it was forced to be cooked at 150 to 160 degrees for a period of time based on the state rules and regulations. <clears throat> so that being said... I can now take this biologically charged compost and take municipal green waste and inoculate the green waste compost with my concentrated biology. So that's a great first step to turning dirt into soil is by putting a great carbon source um, and a tremendous amount of diverse biology um, back into the soil and, and then of course immediately cover cropping it. So, um, Cover cropping serves a number of different functions in soil building. First, if you understand <clears throat> the biological um, realm around the root of a plant is called the rhizosphere, and that's where all the magic happens. <clears throat> so to be able to grow miles and miles of rhizosphere through, through cover crops um, is an amazing way to really start building tilth. Uh, tilth being soil structure, uh, the end goal is aggregation. So in an aggregated soil, um, you will be able to have a wonderful gas exchange, which means allowing CO2 that's being generated by the microbial world to release into the atmosphere, <clears throat> the atmospheric air to be able to go back down and feed the oxygen back to those microbial communities. Um, and let them grow out and therefore produce more CO2 for the plants above <clears throat> to consume and grow even more. So it's just a, it's a continuous loop, perpetual motion that's happening um, on a microscopic scale. Another thing that happens in a cover crop situation is that you are holding moisture in the soil now because the leaves are covering um, that soil and preventing UVs from getting in there. And it also prevents <clears throat> the wind from blowing across it and, and stripping it. Um, most people don't realize that 80% of all soils on the planet are built through transportation. So whether that's erosion or whether that's wind, um, that, <clears throat> that, is, that is how it's built. So once you disturb it <clears throat> and do not have plants on it, the wind will come in and, and blow it away. Um, and in the case out here in California, we'll begin to make the clay uh, compact and turn into um, rather hard balls um, and bake in the sun and, and again, you know, bond together. So, you know, that's the end result of disturbed and abused soil. And so how do you reverse that? Well, you start with adding carbon, adding biology, adding cover crops. And then if necessary, till in. I'm not a big fan of this. I'd rather people roll and crimp. So rolling and crimping basically means rolling over the plants with something that's heavy enough to snap the stalks or crimp them, and then leaving that plant residue as a mat to protect the soil, hold the moisture, and again, further build compost or build carbon and create more food surfaces, sources for the biology that's in play. And if you just continue to do this over the course of <clears throat> several seasons, you will have amazing soil in a very, very short period of time. 
Whereas without these types of practices, um, it takes years. So this is a quick way to uh, rejuvenate, um, repair, uh, disturb soils uh, back to a healthy soil system that will function um, in a way that's, that's very important. I haven't even started talking about the water cycles and how um, in a disturbed soil, you're going to get compaction. So therefore, any rain that you do get is not going to infiltrate. It's going to wash away the surface, uh, again, eroding it. Um, and you're not going to be able to store it in your aggregates. Um, and you're not going to be able to continue to grow your, your, your successionary uh, system of, of building that soil. So <clears throat> the other thing that, that's not talked about is that in a healthy soil system, a healthy organic soil system, it is actually scrubbing the water. Uh, the, uh, yeah, it's scrubbing all of the contaminants, pollutants out of the water um, and making it clean again for the groundwater, which penetrates into aquifer, which is something that we drink. And so we are not recharging our aquifers because we are not maintaining uh, plants on the soil surface and healthy soil aggregates uh, so that every time it rains, we're actually charging back our, our critical freshwater system. So that was that was quite a rant. Um, I don't know if Craig, you had something to add to that. I don't see any hands right now. So why don't you hop on and, and put your feedback in? Oh, one second. I'm just uh, plugging my phone real quick. It's about to die. Oh, that's frustrating. Yes, we don't want you to die on us. <laughs> we Could need I to keep you in the chat. About ashes? I'm sorry, Thomas, go ahead. Could I ask a question about ashes? You were talking about, a lot about ashes and fires. Yeah, sure, fire away. Uh, I was thinking, like, if you're smoking a joint and there's endophytic bacteria in there, they could, I don't know, colonize your lungs, I don't know, something like that. Oh, so that's, that's a that's, that's a great that's a, it's a it's a great question, Thomas, and I'll chime in with that. So thankfully, um, we have our, our 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 epithelial cells, our mucosal membranes are lined with a healthy layer of mucus. So the reality in general is actually at the moment, uh, right now, you're actually breathing in a whole range of bacterial and fungal spores. However, if you're a person who with a Health, with a developed immune system that's pretty healthy, you're pretty much protected. Also, this is pretty important. Also, too, to stay hydrated. It's one of the reasons why in the wintertime when... Uh, this, this is one of the reasons why in the wintertime we actually see a higher incidence of respiratory infections, mostly because the air is a lot drier. Um, depends on your climate, at least for me. Um, I'm, I'm temperate northeast, so we have really hot summers, uh, humid as well. Uh, really cold winters, but also if you're living indoors, the uh, humidity gets is pretty much drops down incredibly low and, and it gets really bone dry indoors. So staying hydrated and staying moisturized, uh, especially with a good amount of <clears throat> water and humidity in the air is essential because it allows your body to produce mucus and keep your epi your um, your mucosal linings can see hydrate making mucus, which will clear everything out as well. So spores are everywhere. Um, these organisms uh, bacteria and fungi have been around for hundreds of millions to billions of years, and they're prolific and everywhere. Um, and also, uh, I don't know, late. this might be a cool thing, kind of reflecting upon some of your, ba your past and building, but I do think about how um, oftentimes with insurance policies, flood insurance, it is one that is rather hard to get, given the fact whenever there's any kind of water introduced in the system, um, whatever material, often organic materials, like um, of of origin of trees or wood, uh, lignin and cellulose, whenever it gets hydrated adequately enough, uh, those spores will germinate and grow. I think I heard that, you know, black mold spores are everywhere in every single building material. It's just a matter of them getting hydrated in the right kind of time for them to germinate as well. Um, so much to the point that actually black mold has actually uh, co-evolved with us as humans as we've actually used building materials. So the reality is spores are everywhere, both bacterial and fungal. Um, however, if you have a healthy immune system, uh, if you're if you're if you're able to be uh, maintain good health, you're in good aspect. Only times that we'll encounter these kind of rare um, infections are usually people that are developing immune systems, like children. 
or um, or elder elderly people who have declining immune systems as well. Uh, aside from whatever kind of health related or diet related products, uh, now problems that may be uh, inc- may, may be combined with that factor as well. So spores are everywhere, and I'm I'm guessing Leighton, you talked about um, how in the wildfires in California and the, on the West Coast they found they did the sample of the uh, the microbes that were living on the smoke plumes, utilizing those free hydrocarbons in the air. Yeah, yeah, I think that was uh, that was something I covered earlier, and I think that was Tomas's uh, reason for asking that question about potential cross uh, contamination or transfer through through smoke. And <clears throat> so, yeah, you're, you're spot on, and and you know that's been a, a big issue in in especially in Florida um, and very moist, uh, warm areas. That if you're not living in a house, the, the black mold will come in very very quickly. Um, and set up shop in corners and dark areas and you know especially in in flooded homes it becomes a real issue because they have such an incredible food sources uh anywhere from the paper on the gypsum um, to the cellulose that that craig was talking about in the wood products so it becomes an issue and but again you know it's it's more of a um an issue with people that have been compromised so someone who has a deficient or a uh, banged up immune system due to, you know, cancer or disease or, or you know, some bad medicine that they've been um, taking, they're the ones that really at risk. Um, we have, like Craig said, co-evolved with, with all these types of molds and spores. And, you know, the only time that, that really become an issue is when we're exposed to a new organism. So uh, way back when during Superstorm Sandy, uh, I happened to end up getting trapped at Rodale Institute with Dr. Lane Ingham. And so we were sitting around playing Uno and drinking a little bit of beer. And I asked her, I said, you know, Lane, I've always had this question burning in my mind. And, you know, I, I love to hear your thoughts on this. And I, I'm like, so did life come through, you know, a miracle, like a God particle or, or something like that? Or, or did it come, did a, did an alien fly by and, and flush his toilet went over the surface of the earth or, or, or was it a comet? And her, her answer, she laughed, of course, about the, the aliens flushing their toilet. But uh, she said, no, no I'm, I'm pretty confident it's a comet. And I said, well, why would you say a comet? And she said, well, if you look back in history, um, every time there was a great plague on the surface of the Earth, there was a comet that had come by, <clears throat> you know, at a certain period uh, before the plague actually took hold. So here's another <clears throat> bit of evidence that perhaps panspermia is a real thing and that these, you know, viruses or biology that we as a species have not come in contact. Um, and when we do, uh, bad things happen. You know, you have a immune system collapse, a cytostorm, whatever you want to call it, similar to, you know, the virus that's going on right now. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to, you know, like think about like all of the things that we have been exposed to. And for some reason, we're still here. Um, Chlorine in our water, fluoride in our water, uh, our food system, um, all the packaging, the forever chemicals, um, you know, the immune shots that we've all had, uh, vaccinations growing up on, on with things that are, you know, highly unstable. And yet we as a species keep growing out of pace uh that that's explosive i mean we're gonna i don't even know how many billions of people we're gonna be in 10 years from now uh, unless we have a collapse but that just goes to show you how hardy um the human body is and and obviously on the cellular level because you know that is the key to the whole thing we had a wonderful um podcast this morning on peter's future cannabis project with uh, dragonfly earth medicine and if any of you never heard of them you should definitely look at them and and understand that they are, you know, a powerhouse and explaining, uh, you know, regenerative farming practices and polyculture and how to grow biomass to feed plants. So biomass, I mean plants and feeding plants with other plants is by far the best way to have a minimal energy uh, drain. Um, so for instance, if, if a plant wanted a specific uh, mineral in the in the soil profile, it would have to expend a tremendous amount of currency. So pull in sunlight, 
create ATP, which is basically its currency to making enzymes, proteins, aminos. Um, and then from there, it would transfer uh, exudates down into the soil. It said up to 70% of all the energy the plant um, creates is spent in um, creating exudates to feed the biology. So the biology has enough energy to mine the material, say phosphorus out of a piece of clay, a platelet of clay, and then bring it back and then pull it up and then, then distribute it throughout the whole plant system. So that's an incredible amount of work. So to take a plant that's already done all that work, uh, ferment it, grind it, uh, compost it, um, liquefy it, and then feed the other plants with it, um, it's obviously a huge uh, energy credit. And so therefore that plant can then focus more on pushing roots, which is what you want it to do because that's building more rhizosphere, that's building more till, that's building more surface area for biology to evolve, grow out uh, and do its job um, versus you know forcing the plant to do all of that work on its own. Um, so you know as a, as, a, as a group, I really wish that you know people would start to think more about um, these kinds of fertiliz fertilization, over you know bags and uh, salts and and uh, you know any synthetic inputs, um, we've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt in the last uh, ten to twenty years that you don't really need synthetics. You don't need to put any fertility in the soil. I mean, I always ask people to get a soil for chemistry test. I actually ask them to do three tests for me. Number one is soil texture, so I know what the sand silt clay level are and organic matter. I know if the soil is prone to compaction or if it's going to be an easy transfer into a healthy soil system. Um, then I'll do a chemistry test because that's very important to understand micronutrients and trace elements. Um, these are critical for plant functions. You might have all, the, all of the NPK in your soil that you could possibly want, but if you don't have any molybdenum, it can't pull up the, can't pull up the, the, the nitrogen or if, if you're low on potassium. Um, it, the plant can't trans, uh, transportate, uh, pff, transpire. So again, the plant can't ex, exhale excess moisture or use that as a way to wick uh, nutrients up. And how well is that plant going to survive? So those those trace and and micronutrients are are as critical and more so than anything. So by starting there. I now know where I'm at, but once I know where I'm at, then it's just a matter of picking the appropriate plants to, to continue to push that soil system in the successionary direction that I want it to. So um, by that, I mean, um, if you see weeds, personally, there's no such thing as a weed, but in many ways, that plant is pulling up a specific nutrient to the surface of the earth to provide a successionary platform for the next level of plants to come in. So it starts with, with swamps and brassicas, and then it moves all the way up into, you know, monster conifers and redwoods where you're having a fungal to bacteria ra ratio um, as high as 10,000 uh, fungi to one bacteria versus in a riparian system, uh, you may have uh, less than one uh, percent um, fungi to bacteria. In a traditional soil system uh, for ag, we, we tend to look for a one-to-one -one relationship between fungi to bacteria. But these, this is, you know, this is all the, the foundation of, of um, pushing soil into a more healthy, productive system. Um, again, if you're, if you're missing some of the kingdoms, uh, perhaps you, you don't have any fungi, which is one of the most fragile um, of the organisms in the soil system then your potential for growing healthy plants, um, specifically like crops, is, is going to be such a challenge. Um, and this is exactly why we've gone down the spiral of, of losing nutrition in our foods, because we've wiped out the fungi uh, through plowing and, and applications of fungicides and, and insecticides and herbicides. And so, you know, they are, they are a critical component to keeping the plant healthy. Uh, mining nutrients, supplying those nutrients to the plant. I mean, they do probably 50% of the heavy lifting in the soil. Um, the other 50% would be the bacteria and the protozoa. So the bacteria are controlled two ways. 
one if the plant is looking for a specific mineral um, it will grow it will excrete a certain exudate to feed just that bacteria to grow them out as fast as they can in anticipation of needing a certain mineral uh, shortly or, or immediately and so that plant has a choice it can grow them out um, and if the protozoa don't show up and start consuming them and releasing that nutrient back to the root in a plant available form the plant can just shut off that exudate and essentially starve them out and uh, this is another um, really kind of unique um, or cutting edge understanding of um, exudates so if a plant leaks out a whole bunch of exudates and there's nobody there to accept it um, because of such poor soil health um, it's it's excreting this one for it needs a potassium so it's it's excreting a cookie specifically for a potassium solubilizing bacteria and no one's showing up um, what happens to those exudates so there's a gentleman that created a new testing standard i believe his company's out of maine i do not know the name of them of the company uh, but he's found a way to actually measure extra or excess exudates in the form of um, volatile uh, carbon so volatile compounds are like terpenes or perfumes uh, flowers there they don't last long uh, they'll smell for vividly for a period of time but that's why they're called volatile because they they evaporate they they disintegrate they break down very quickly so this vol uh, volatile organic carbon source is really interesting in determining how balanced that soil system is so if you have a very balanced soil system you're not going to have much of that but if you have an out of whack soil system which the vast majority of the surface of the earth is out of whack at this point you are going to have a buildup of that <clears throat> excess uh, volatile organic um, exudate. And so what does that mean? Where is that, where is that going? And probably not in a direction that's beneficial unless we have a horizontal gene transfer and a couple of different types of bacteria learn to eat this specific exudate and then perhaps start performing uh, other processes that the plant can accept or use or are beneficial. So, uh, Craig, maybe you could uh, expand a little on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think kind of like I mentioned earlier was that we were going to talk about the bacterial fungal interactions. So it's kind of crazy because I think previously on the kind of soil food where we talked about how, yes, there is there is plant bacteria interface. There's plant fungal interface however the reality is there's even interface where it's plant to fungi to bacteria so it's the kind of the factor is that you're getting kind of these these exponential effects when you do have the additional diversity uh and so yeah like the reason why like you know fungi we've diminished them is because when we're talking about fungi we're talking about primarily filamentous fungi we're talking about fungi that actually have these long <clears throat> strands of hyphae which make these mats of mycelium uh, yeast are fungi as well. Um, they can form uh, filaments and hyphae in some cases, but usually they're budding. They usually play a much larger role in the kind of earlier stages in soil development, especially with certain types of fermentation to make certain nutrients available. However, through the um, over tillage, you're breaking up these hypofilaments. Um, and even the in the soil, there isn't just uh, mycorrhizal fungi. There are, there are, sap, sap, uh, there are saprobes, uh, decomposer fungi of a whole different varieties and even different types of secondary and tertiary decomposers. So the idea is through this over tilling of our soils, you know, I, I, one of the, some of the, I think some of the earliest uh, kind of uh, recordings of uh, journals of uh, basically Europeans that came over to, to the Americas um, were remarked, were, were basically re recorded more so that they were blown away by how fertile the soil was, given the fact that in Europe, I believe uh, Europe, uh, in Europe, uh, it was clear cut by I think by 500 AD, where they destroyed most of their old growth over there as well. So this kind of led to a number of, number of uh, socio-political stratifications as you know through mismanagement of soil that had carried over. So they continued on their their notion of how they went about agriculture, whereas indigenous peoples in the Americas were practicing uh, a variety of different types of uh, cult cultivation of foods, but also predominantly one to note was kind of this agroforestry. 
uh, understanding that you weren't didn't necessarily had to plow down an entire thicket of wood that you could do neat nice rows crops that you could plant into systems to make them work and even to have guilds of plants that work together as well so it's something that we're we need to we're starting to realize how damaging and detrimental um the methods of agriculture are and even to the reality is compost is great but if you still practice tillage you're still going to have the same problem you're still going to get getting uh returns that are a fraction of what they could be if we minimize disturbance of the soil as well and understand that you're maximizing this biodiversity by not over disturbing it as well and there are certain conditions where you do have to do certain things but the idea is whenever you do disturb the soil you need to be giving it back to it with a combination of organic matter and the right kind of inoculum that is going to be restoring that diversity that might have been impacted by that disturbance. Uh, a, note on, a note as well about <clears throat> percentages of biomass of exudates going down to the soil. Uh, what's really exciting is a lot of this research has recently uh, been done by Dr. Dave Johnson. Um, he, he, I, think he's, I think he's based out of uh, New Mexico, but he also t does work out of uh, Chico State in California as well. So his background has been in molecular biology as well. So a big part of him is he started investigating how to solve the problem of of, uh, of basically cattle manure that was incredibly high in salt load. Um, if your most cattle is fed um, feed that has lots of salts in it and this concentrates even further in the manure, so much to the point where the concentration of salt is so high it'll actually burn your plants if you apply it. So he was looking into ways that he could make compost and ways that you could compost these there are manures that often were too, too basically the salinity content was so high it would throw off most kind of aerobic composting systems. So I think most people have heard about the uh, the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. Pretty much, it's a um, it's a static uh, aerated compost pile. So pretty much, it's it's similar to the <clears throat> standing cylinders of hardware cloth that Dr. Elaine. Uh, has set up as well, but the notion is it's significantly higher, mostly kind of to fit the yield of the compost. But the idea is you have a central tube going down the middle. So the idea is that not one single point of the pile, um, there isn't a distance further than one foot from fresh air exchange. So the idea is this could sit here for the greater quarter year, uh, mixed in the proper proportion and basically slowly decompose, but it would be incredibly rich fungal compost. Um, even further could be taken even more, like uh, keeping speed of the process by adding basically worms by kind of having this static, passively aerated um, vermicompost as well. <clears throat> so one of the work, some of the work he did on this as well was by basically doing some genetic sequencing on it, not just DNA sequencing, but, but RNA sequencing. So anyone who's familiar um, to identify organisms will do DNA sequencing. So we're looking at basically their basis, their genetic code. However, DNA is more so just the storage molecule. What actually uh, allows you to basically synthesize proteins, the instructions for it, um, is actually the RNA. So you the kind of simple way to kind of knowledge, skip, analogy give for this for anyone who doesn't have a background in molecular biology or biochemistry. Think about DNA as like the recipe book, right? Let's say you have a, a mother or grandmother who has like a, a recipe for like cookies, chocolate, chocolate chip cookies, however. Let's say you want that recipe. Um, you know, let's say the recipe book's like a family heirloom. You, you know, it's not really loaned out too too often. So that that book is pretty important. So you would jot down that recipe on a note card, right? You would tr you would basically transcribe it onto a note card. So that note card, right? It's, it's you know it's handwritten. You know, it can have tears and it could you can get spill some coffee on. It's fine because it's a note card. But then you would still, that would allow you to basically turn that recipe in the note card into the cookies, right? You'd be able to translate it. So we can think about the DNA being like the, the heirloom, you know, recipe book. We can think about RNA being the trans, basically the transcript of the RNA being like the note card and that RNA will be translated into a protein as well. So one thing with the, with, with kind of the, this, uh, this omics approach, omics refers to basically looking at the genome in different kinds of way, whether it's DNA, RNA, you can look at the pro, uh, proteomics or even the metabolomics, and we'll get into that tonight. Uh, but the idea is if you look at the transcripts, you look at the RNAs, you can see what genes are being expressed to code for certain proteins. 
So Dr. Jabe Johnson showed that in some of these advanced composts that had maximum biodiversity, the highest number of genes being expressed were for quorum sensing. So quorum sensing is a fancy word for basically saying, okay, who's home and who's around? So we could buddy up and do things together, right? It's like, it's like someone calling out in a room like, hey, yo, like, and you'd basically be able to communicate with your friends, your colleagues who are there in a crowded room where you may be able to work with other people or maybe not who's there. So this is essential because you're actually seeing these huge shifts in intermicrobial communities interactions, right? And one kind of thing that's amazing to think about is that, you know, you as an individual, right? You as a person, a human being, right? We tend to think of ourselves as a single entity. However, we're 35 trillion cells. Every cell in your body has the same DNA. However, every cell in your body, there's roughly around 300 cell types. Of those 300 cell types, each one of those cell types expressing a certain part of that genome. That, that's basically what allows a photoreceptor cell in your eye to be a rod, right? To basically receive, basically detect photons and translate that into an ocean of light reflecting off something in the environment that would tell your brain that's what it is. Or let's see an epithelial cell in your, in your stomach that actually is able to secrete digestive enzymes and acids, right? So it's pretty important that you wouldn't want a photoreceptor cell in your eyes or acting like an epithelial cell in your stomach, right? So this is really important for this kind of expression of certain parts of the genome. Realize that these microbial consortiums, they're not just there. They're not just doing things. They have these huge interconnections, inter intercalations that we are only beginning to understand. Anyway, so big loop back, we talked about the efficiency of exudates, right? Leighton mentioned earlier that, you know, these plants, they're putting down upwards of 70% of their, their exudates, the sugars they produce during photosynthesis down in the root system. What's amazing, what some of Dr. Gabe Johnson research showed is that when you have an established microbial community, the plant is initially putting down those exudates down in the soil to attract the microbes it needs. Once it has them, and it's actually established that microbial community and biodiversity, it will then reduce the amount of exudates, put it down in the microbial community, and then start focusing on putting those resources into its shoots, its stems, its leaf, and its fruit development. So this is the thing about it, like the plant is, is a plant that does not have to try to struggle to survive, it has support of its microbial community. So this is the thing about it, like, you know, it's kind of like a broken record, talking about micro microbes, but we've only just barely begun to scratch the surface of how deep this goes. But the notion is that the principle is simple, understanding that maximizing diversity is important. And un we can try only, we, and we have means and methods to try to get an intuition about this. So this is kind of why it's pretty thrilling to talk about this stuff because we're really at a point in history where for the first time using genetic techniques of a whole variety, they're becoming even more affordable. And then we're able to even have the, the processing computation power to process all this data that we're sequencing and, and make connections between what it means in the real world. God, now you guys know what it's like to chop it up with him on Fridays, him and, him and Leaf. <laughs> Woo, we go down rabbit holes. Yeah, Peter, uh, I'm glad you got this one on tape too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, you know, the, the question that came up today in, in today's podcast was, was who's in charge? Our, you know, we, we think of ourselves as individuals um, and we think that we have the power to, to make decisions um, about 
the direction of of everything that that we come in contact with in our life but is it really a message that we're receiving from uh, a cellular level that that's determining our actions and our courses of actions and it's it's a hard one it's it's goes back to the question of where does the soil end and the plant start um you know it's it's a deep one and again it's a very exciting time to be alive um, and have access to these kinds of uh information and and discoveries on such a grand level um you know and again the human race you know we're driving this this potential uh for for incredible breakthroughs as a result of a community not as an individual and uh you know that's again kind of you know a deep deeper perspective of of the challenges that we have as well as the potential we have um i've i speak a lot about plant potential and how to reach it because um again that's the goal we're, we're either trying to get uh, buds from a cannabis plants or orange from an orange tree and and how do we how do we how do we protect the tree or the plant and encourage uh, it to produce more of the things that we want. Well, the only way to do that is through community. So again, like everybody coming together and working in unison to support a system that they believe in um, and helping establish that healthy uh, plant to help produce more nutrient dense uh, byproducts or secondary metabolites that, that, that we're looking for. And so, you know, again, I, you know, I love, I love how we are diving down a, a, a greater rabbit hole than just a simple conversation about living soil. But I think it's important um, that we do this because this is, this, this is giving, or it's expanding your mind, opening your eyes, opening your ears to, to the fact of how insignificant one little bacteria is in a huge community. And again, you know, there's, succession and and you know this this is yet to get really uh studied hard that that you know it takes a village it takes this whole community to function through building biofilms to support breakdown of different minerals and nutrients for the next level of successionary biology to take hold um and and again pushing the whole system forward in a manner that your end result um you're hitting full plant potential or full expression, genetic expression of, of that plant or animal for that but lack of better words. Um, you know, again, you know, it's like healthy plants, healthy consumers, healthy people. And so, you know, this, this is, this is why this conversation is so important at this point in time is that, you know, we've got a lot of issues. Um, that are pretty damn obvious to most people that don't have their head buried in the sand um, about how to how to get human health back on track. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is to start rebuilding healthy environments, healthy water, healthy food. Um, and that in turn will will drive a better genetic expression of each of the individuals that are exposed to those things um and in turn drive the whole system in a better direction you know i i get very very frustrated with humanity as a whole because we keep making the same damn mistake for thousands and thousands and thousands of years i mean i i don't know the latest the uh, the articles keep coming up that you know we're we're potentially as old as a million years uh the first earliest uh human beings and yet we had the the most incredible potential as a species to do amazing things but yet we're governed by power and money uh corruption and greed that that's driven us to a point where um at this point we're almost all virtual slaves to a system that we can't see smell or touch kind of like the matrix we're just batteries in a in a in a larger body or or organism and you know that's that's frustrating because we are not at our full potential uh, nowhere near our full potential i mean 
the, the things that we could have done uh, with all of the money that was spent on just warfare uh, would be would be mind boggling. The, the, the evolution that we could have uh, become um, without killing each other or creating forces, um, you know, it, it, it just it's mind boggling. And so at some point, you know, I, I pray that humanity uh, learns this this valuable mistake that they keep making about um, perhaps wanting to be in charge or in control and, and how power corrupts an absolute power corrupts absolutely to the point where no matter what you're not going to let go of your reins of power regardless of what it means to the civilization um, that is underneath you and the community that's around you um, sorry i didn't mean to go go down that rabbit hole but i think that it's an, an important conversation to have and think about when you're talking about soil health and protecting that diversity and that community from repeating the same mistake that, that humanity has done. Um, you know, encouraging diversity in uh, every way you possibly can and never, never stopping. Um, you know, soil is always there to be, to be added to and incur, uh, enhanced with, with minerals or with, with biology or with compost. And, you know, that's, that's where you're going to get um, that, full potential or full genetic expression. Um, so one other little tad bit on, on um, the Johnson Sioux. The other, the other reason uh, that gentleman um, came up with just using pure manure, which I, I think Craig mentioned, but I wanted to just kind of send that home was because traditionally you, you just compost straight manure. Uh, it's going to get stinky and hot really quick. Um, but he's in such an arid environment um, with so little humidity that that you, it's almost impossible to compost uh, in a traditional manner without using a tremendous amount of water resources. So that was another one of the goals that he set out to do was to take a byproduct, a waste product, um, and convert it into something that was valuable um, in those in that temperate uh, or tepid or what does it say, extremely arid uh, climate. Now, Arizona and, and New Mexico weren't always arid. It was uh, an unfortunate consequence of the uh, pioneers moving across and you know, coming into these gorgeous, rich, eight foot high hay fields um, and saying, wow, this is amazing. I can grow anything here. And of course, uh, what they didn't realize was when they cut that hay down and tilled the soil, um, they were exposing that fragile soil system um, to evaporation, and of course, wind. Wind is uh, one of the um, quickest ways to dry out humidity. And so quickly that, that fertile, uh, incredibly fertile soil um, became transported into dust and then you know, later into dust bowls uh, in, the, in the early 20s because of you know, this incredible pressure uh, to take down what nature had created to successionary get to where it was <clears throat> so the the system is as as incredibly big and as powerful as it seems um is actually very very fragile uh when it's when it's exposed to forces uh that can be very destructive you know plows and you know early plows with horses and then tractors and um you know it's 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 staggering how much earth you could move or till um, in, in a matter of hours nowadays with some of the, the equipment that, that is available. Um, and we've, we've got to stop that. We've, we've got to stop the, the tillage and, and start getting into this uh, roll and crimp uh, manners or methods so that we don't lose that incredible, powerful organic matter. So quick brief discussion on soil horizons. <clears throat> the soil horizon, horizon system is, is basically showing us how those soils were formed. And earlier I touched on um, the, the vast majority of soils are transported. Uh, so that means that they were blown or, or washed <clears throat> into a uh, profile. And the reason that profile functions so well um, is twofold. One is the plant interaction, but also because it was transported slowly, it wasn't just scooped up and dropped. Um, it was able to create uh, micro pockets, uh, encourage uh, biology, bacteria specifically to 
uh, create biofilms and start bonding those particulate together uh, in creating microaggregates, um, which then as that species of bacteria evolved, uh, more and more uh, communities came in and, and the process kept going. Um, so to think that we can just scoop some soil and throw it in a, in a raised bed or in a garden and expect it to just take hold and go crazy um, is, is rather insane if you think about it. And so um, to think that we with a till could literally disrupt perhaps thousands of years of, of soil being transported to build that incredibly uh, soil profile is horrifying. And the, the, the most fragile part of the soil profile is the surface, which is called the O-horizon. And O stands for organic matter. So in a rainforest, that O-horizon may only be an inch deep, maybe less in some places. You know, people often think that the most fertile places on the planet um, are the rainforest, and they're not. They're the most fragile. Uh, the most fertile soils on the planet, actually, America has two-thirds of them. Uh, two-thirds of our country has the andesols and hydrosols, I think it is. Um, it's been a while since I studied my soil science. But anyway, um, so those two soil profiles are the most for fertile soil profiles in the world. And two-thirds of our country are covered by them. And since then, we've plowed them all up. And turn them around and you know obviously cause some some serious damage so now how do we how do we reverse that damage and you know that's part of this living soil conversation is how how to cost effectively turn that around and start pushing it in the opposite direction toward soil health and building of that organic horizon that is the first thing to blow or wash away when you don't have any cover or any crops or any, you know, if you have bare soil. Um, I was present during a couple of really strong Santa Ana's out here and I could literally watch the dust clouds come in. And it was, it, it almost made me cry to think that, you know, my God, that why, why are these fields all just bare? When I drive, if anyone doesn't know, Oxnard is probably one of the biggest agricultural communities anywhere. And the reason why is just because of the incredible fertility of the volcanic soil um, the amazing uh, amount of um, microclimates where the moisture from the ocean is driven up into the valleys through convection. So the heating of the deserts and mountains, the air rises and it's drawing in that beautiful, cool, moist air that's loaded with, with all the micronutrients from the, from the salt air. And so, you know, of all places in the world to, to not let that happen, um, would be right here. And yet it is, it is prolific, the amount of fields that are left bare uh, and not cover crops. So it's, it's kind of a horrifying thought, um, but this is, you know, this is the reason why I'm screaming as loud as I am around here to try to get people to start thinking in, in, in a different manner on how best to, uh, how best to start rehabbing and moving, moving this in a, in a better direction. So I don't know if there's any questions out there. We probably ought to reset the room. Uh, my name is Leighton Morrison. I'm a soil biologist, soil engineer. Um, I'm, I'm trying to educate uh, the masses as to better ways to um, utilize soil and, and push ecology to uh, full plant potential, healthy food, and start cleaning up the water source. And Craig, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? That was great, Leighton. Thanks for sharing all that. Definitely want to add to it, but I'll just reset the room real quick as well. My name is Craig Truster. I'm in the applied mycologist, citizen scientist, and educator. A lot of my background is in fungi. Um, I got into studying fungi, um, you know, for those who aren't familiar, mushrooms, mycelium, mold. You know, I always think back to kind of the Egon quote from Ghostbusters. Do you have any hobbies? I collect mold spores and fungus. But also the larger approach rather than just kind of taxonomic classification. But yeah, a lot of my focus uh, was more so interested in bioremediation um, given the fact that, you know, organisms have an incredible potential to generate, utilize the sun's energy, mostly from plants, store that in organic content, and then use these metabolisms to basically detoxify their environment, break down 
organic contaminants and mobilize inorganic contaminants, change them in states which they're immobile or change them into redox states where they're just not even biologically available. So fungi was kind of that branching. Once I heard of biomediation, but micromediation, I'm sure everyone's kind of seen the Paul Stamets talk. That was several years ago when I kind of had my first viewing of that. And definitely uh, where I was mushroom or mycocentric, uh, I really kind of dove into soil and learn that fungi, albeit they do, they are the architects of the soil, um, they set the stage for so many other organisms, which in a synergistic effect kind of do mind bending things. Um, so it's pretty amazing that capacity as well. So currently I'm working with a number of organizations in New York City, uh, trying to bring a number of regenerative farming methods to urban agriculture. Uh, I think a lot of people have done amazing work in kind of rural or suburban areas in grows indoors or commercial but I think really to show the strength of regenerative agriculture is the notion that it could be done at a smaller scale even in the environments most people think would be impossible so I think that's kind of the future as well and I could definitely talk more about that but yeah kind of elaborating on what Leighton mentioned earlier about uh, the notion of you know geology and different soil types especially with soil chemistry, um, we are kind of experienced in the world based upon the ecological uh, snapshot, right? You know, ecologies come and go based upon events. Uh, these can be disturbances that basically have errors. We even classify time based upon geological time, right? So the geological time we're right now is the Holocene. Um, we're now think we're entering the Anthropocene, which is the fact that we've had a prolific effect upon our environment. But we're just in the blink of the eye of the kind of the Earth's history. Um, and every single ecological setting is preset by a geological setting. We think that uh, modern humans kind of like started domesticating plants and animals, given the fact that in Africa, it was understood, I believe that this is still a current uh, hypothesis or theory, that the entire continent north where the Sahara was was green so our ancestors more so meandered as we followed animals and then there was a sudden shift in climate and more so the this air this desertification this aridification so we started setting up shop near estuaries and bodies of water learning how to domesticate certain types of plants and animals so this is something too is that as a species you know our our eldest simian ancestors where we kind of separated from um you know other simians other other great apes uh we understand it to be uh several million years ago modern humans i believe uh two to three hundred thousand years ago and estimate that we domesticated plants and animals around seventeen thousand years ago but this is such a blink in the eye compared to the grand scale the geological time scale so even let's let's kind of go back to the rainforest, right? The rainforest is such a place that is so alive due to the warm temperature and the abundant amount of rain. You know, most organisms, right? You know, you gotta you gotta you gotta perform some kind of work to generate energy to keep you going. However, if the ambient temperature, the heat energy available in the air is already pretty high hey, that's less work you got to do, right? And this is something we kind of take for granted, we're warm-blooded. But if you've ever seen a lizard sitting out on basically a stone on a hot, on a hot, on a hot day, they're cold-blooded. They require upon the environmental energy that's there. And the same thing for microbes as well. And this also can set the entire ecology and environment. So while everything is lush and growing as well, the minute a leaf falls on the ground or organic matter is available, it is being consumed by some consortium of organism microscopic or macroscopic and even further what's really amazing is that most of the minerals that are available for the rainforest are actually coming from these dust storms that basically blow across the atlantic so in africa in in, in central africa in chad there was a once a great lake thousands of years ago it's and it's a salt flat it's really amazing because they're finding fossils of like alligators and hippopotamuses and fish and this lake dried up and these animals are trapped in it and it dried out but the nutrient rich salt flat along with all the nutrients in the carcasses and bodies in lake chad blows over the atlantic ocean 
over to the rainforest. And it's pretty amazing because all those minerals that are there being deposited with the wind. And this is a notion too, this is, this is you could even consider aerogeology, which is kind of mind blowing, right? Because the reality is that this, in, a, in, a, in a place, the rainforest where everything is so growing so rapidly, where the soil is so poor, you have these amazing situations. I think there's even been done some research that basically uh, lightning storms that actually do hit in the rainforest, well, the energy from the lightning storm will actually allow nitrogen fixation to basically be sped up. So there's all these processes by interactions between the abiotic conditions, whether it's weather, wind, transportation, with the biotic conditions. So yeah, the thing is, the best way to kind of approach these things is to understand that, you know, and this is, does see, sound a bit cliche, but everything is connected. But the notion is that to think in a dynamic, non-linear way, you realize how big these things are, that you are merely part of a much larger structure. You know, the best metaphor I can talk about is that if you ever, you know, spent some time on YouTube or read about Benoit Mandelbrot or you know, you had a college roommate that had a cool fractal poster, right? The thing about, you know, fractals is that it's really hard to say where one thing is. If you're zoomed in in one section, it's hard to know where you are in this kind of structure. It's so immense and big and it reiterates upon itself motif. And much like that in, the, in, the, in our world, on our planet, you know, pretty much most, it's, it's everything is so intricately connected we tend to forget that, but it's hard to kind of, like you say, like, where do I end and you begin in that notion, especially too, when we're getting down to all the different types of life, they're able to occupy a certain niche, position, opportunity, collaboration, interaction. So that's kind of just a note to kind of, uh, you know, kick, kick the can down the road for conversation if anyone's interested in any kind of questions, comments, or what have you. <laughs> oh, that was good. I love it. Uh, yeah, you know, it's ironic that you talk about um, how some of these geological events um, basically laying waste to one uh, incredible system provide the foundation for the next one. So an article I was reading uh, in the last day or two about the asteroid strike uh, near the Yucatan Peninsula, and I think it actually formed it. Gulf of Mexico is the strike zone, um, wiped out the dinosaurs, but laid the foundation for the Amazon rainforest basin. Um, and so, you know, these kinds of events that, that, that happen naturally through, you know, interactions within the structure of the planet uh, or, or outside influences in the case of an asteroid, um, you know, we could talk about Mount St. Helens and, and what happened there. Um, basically devastated, you know, I don't know how many thousands of acres when that went off. And then within three to five years, it came back with a vengeance. Uh, but you have to understand there was clearly a biological uh, and, and plant shift when that happened. So these kinds of resets um, are, are, are critical in, in, you know, continuing the succession or evolution of of the system as a whole. And, you know, I loved your, your comment on fractals. I mean, yeah, if you really look at a fractal, you don't know where it begins or where it ends. It just keeps going. It's a wormhole. Um, and I'd love to go down wormholes tonight, but probably a little too late to do that, but <laughs> folding of time and whatnot. Um, I did see some, some buddies out there. I pinged a couple of you, uh, Looks like you guys are gone, unfortunately. All right. Uh, Joe's there. If Joe, if you would like to come up and talk, um, you know, please don't hesitate. Uh, yeah. And, and there are also a lot of, you know, regenerative farmers and natural farmers uh, in the crowd tonight. So if anyone wants to come talk about kind of what they're working on right now, what they're experimenting with, uh, share it with everyone. That'd be kind of cool. All right, welcome up, Joe. Joe, please introduce yourself. Much love and respect, my man. Hey, thanks so much, Leighton, Craig, and Peter. I always love you guys' conversations. I learned so much just listening to you guys. 
Hey, uh, hello everyone. My name is Joe McGinn. I'm over in Honolulu, Hawaii, and I have been so fortunate to have learned a method of regenerative agriculture that is, I believe, right now, probably one of the fastest growing forms of agriculture in the world right now. It's referred to as Korean natural farming or KNF. And uh, essentially, the system uses no chemical fertilizers, no chemical poisons. We use simple household items like rice and brown sugar to culture indigenous microorganisms and also to be able to do incredible, incredible things like have odorless livestock, to be able to produce our own fermented feeds and to also be able to detoxify and revive our soils through the power of these microbes in addition to uh, a whole um, arsenal of different tools that we have within the system. So I, I, I love always listening to uh, Leighton speak because he provides the science behind some of these cultural practices that we've had here in the Asia Pacific region for generations. So it's, it's bringing, um, you know, opportunities like this to, for us to have discussions allows us to bring the culture and science together and, and see and understand things in new ways. Uh, I, I just am really grateful and thanks so much, guys. I love the conversations. Awesome. Thank you, Joe, for coming on up. Johnny, how's it going? You want to introduce yourself? Uh, I think you've been on brew before. It's my, my, I apologize. I've been super busy getting this new project going in the past few weeks, but I'd love to hear about. And then maybe I can, uh, we can stoke the room with a question and kick on the conversation for the last bit of our session tonight. Go ahead. Hey, guys. I'm Johnny. Um, I'm li currently living in Humboldt County, California. And uh, really appreciate all the info you guys are dropping here. It's a pleasure to be listening. Um, so I actually have a question on um, brassicas and their relationship with fungi in the soil or rather their lack of relationship. I was having an interesting conversation earlier um, with someone who advised not to make uh, a fermented plant juice, which is a uh, it's a formula used in Korean natural farming. Um, but essentially, he was advising not to make a fermented plant juice out of running the risk that you could damage some of your your, your fungal associations in the root zone. And I was wondering uh, what your guys' take on all that was or would be. So I'm still uh, I'm still I'm a student of Chris uh, Trump, and I'm definitely learning as much as I can about natural farming. Um, but I can definitely answer the question about brassicas or cruciferous uh, vegetables and fungi. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, and then we can kind of go down the notion of anyone who's more experienced about using, uh, fer fermenting them for certain uses of benefits or, um, you know, disadvantages. Anyway, so currently, we've probably heard this before, um, kind of a sound, but that gets repeated, which is great. It's really important. Um, so we currently understand that... Um, upwards about 90% of all plants have some kind of fungal relationship, some kind of mycorrhizal association, either as a arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that do not produce uh, fruiting bodies that make these small spores um, on their actual mycelium or a, or a ecto mycorrhizal relationship. So these are fungi that actually grow on the outside sheets of the plants. And there's a whole bunch of them as well. But um, so it's currently thought, so the simple notion is that you can, it's, you can count the plants that don't have a mycorrhizal relationship than do. However, what's really in, interesting is that <laughs> in the past few years, uh, we started investigating something called dark septate endophytes. And what's really interesting is that we previously thought that these were, um, you know, certain structures inside the plants were some types of endophytes made bacteria but it turns out they are indeed fungi and they actually do include into the brassica and the cruciferous plants the brassicas so even further um, the number continues to increase the, the the margin of plants that do not have a fungal connection whether it be a uh in our but an endomycorrhizal an ectomycorrhizal or even a dark septic endophyte is that as well so um, to my current understanding, uh, those plants that were class thought not to have an association do, but it was under a different notion that required a different staining technique to see them in that function as well. So just to provide some basis on that fungal plant relationship and association. You know, that it is a great question, Johnny. Um, 
you know, it, it's like crabgrass, all right? So crabgrass has an amazing ability to excrete an herbicide uh, out of its roots as an exudate. And that's how crabgrass um, can take hold and, and get out of balance, get out of control in, in situations, especially where you have high nitrogen or ammonia, uh, you know, uh, synthetic fertilizers, um, you've got heat um, and, and very shallow roots. The, the, the crabgrass grows horizontally, it does not grow down. Um, so it's basically a, uh, it has the ability to colonize and push out uh, the other competition because its roots go horizontally and it can create this exudate that's essentially a herbicide. So my gut feeling is that, and again, I don't, this is anecdotal, uh, but I, my gut feeling is that the brassicas uh, have a similar uh, strategy for uh, keeping the fungi at bay um, and therefore uh, maintaining their uh, bacterial dominant soils. Um, there's probably got to be some work on it. And it does make sense that fermenting it, you would probably be encouraging um, the growth of the bacteria that's perhaps performing that, that task of uh, ex consuming those exudates and continuing to push back the pressure. Um, but it also could be due to the fact that most brassicas um, like a different soil system. Now, the ones that we've cultivated, uh, in the case of kale, um, it's a little different. Uh, so in a tradition or in a existing ecosystem, most brassicas are grown growing in a riparian system, which is going to be very low oxygen. And so they're going to be uh, associated with what would we call either oxygen or low oxygen tolerant or facultative anaerobes, um, which are also, you know, kind of pushing that system forward. Um, but, you know, it might be interesting to actually take a, take a plant like kale, which is a dynamic accumulator and juicing it instead of fermenting it. So now what you've done is, and you know what I mean by juice, I mean an auger press. So you're squeezing out the peptides, the enzymes, the metabolites, um, you know, all of the, the, the cell juices or, or easy water, all of the things inside. Um, I would tend to think that that would be an incredible um, value to uh, an existing, you know, whether it's a cannabis plant or another crop, uh, because you're not, you're not having the, the, the association of the exudates, you're not having the association of potentially the anaerobes that are, that are, you know, fighting off this fungal association, but you are getting all of the hard work that that plant did to uptake those nutrients. And again, feeding plants, plants is way easier uh, on the expenditure of energy currency, uh, ATP in the plant itself. So it's a, it's a great question. I, I, you know, I'm fascinated by it. And, uh, I'm definitely going to put that on the radar to, to, to keep my eye out or reach out to some people I know or uh, chase down some papers on, on that. Uh, very cool question. Thank you, Johnny. Is there anything? Definitely, definitely to add to that. Um, I think there's a good amount of intuition to be gathered from a number of people. Um, if you're ever curious or if you have any friends that are actually herbalists, have a conversation with them because a number of powerful plants that have a number of high nutrient profiles and, you know, herbalism is pretty interesting. It's different ways and ways of look at it for me, you know, either a bioscience model with nutrients and reduction or kind of a by, by doctrine signatures or associations, but still different plants. They've evolved a strategy to accumulate or process certain types of environments, certain types of nutrients, certain types of conditions. But on, on the, uh, the brassicas note, they're basically in the mustard family. Um, so in general, they're producing a number of rich sulfur containing compounds. Um, this is often a kind of a defense strategy as well. This is actually, I think a number of uh, beneficial antioxidants for us. I think sulforaphane is one in general, um, which can be basically help with a number of age related processes, 
uh, and other kind of stress related aspects to stimulate human health. But yeah, um, understanding the plant, um, what is its mechanism to help it survive in certain environments? What kind of compounds is it producing? We tend to forget that, you know, you know, that basically the whole range of basically cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, chard, arugula, uh, it's, you know, kohlrabi, they're all part of this family and they have share some types of attributes. And what's really interesting is that as human beings, we've just domesticated them. We've domesticated certain types of <clears throat> basically varieties based upon certain types of the plan of prominence of making larger flowers, larger buds, larger leaves, larger stems, larger roots. Um, so there are some, you know, some plants, you know, brassica is one of them. Uh, the descend of basically all different, these types of wild musters that kind of were a slam dunk for human cultivation, probably because they were so easy to grow, even in marginal soils. Wow, well said, Craig. Yeah, and they provided nutrient in, you know, so it was easy to grow in, in a low nutrient um, environment. And yet, um, and as we consume them, we got the benefits of the minerals and nutrients that they pulled out through their hard work. So, um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about, you know, the, the level of domestication that we had done um, through thousands of years, uh, taking crops that would grow in a riparian system and pushing them into a production system where um, we use them as staples. Um, so that was, thank you, Craig. That was, that was great. Johnny, did you have a, a follow-up on that or uh, anything else you wanted to share tonight? No, you guys kind of kind of covered it. Um, I'm definitely going to be looking for more uh, more follow up on that in the future. Um, so far, what I've seen is kind of just a it's like a mixed bag of answers. Some people are are under the assumption that it's it's a uh, it's more of like a defense mechanism for the plant, and it's it's not creating these compounds, these antifungal compounds, whereas other people kind of are. So I'm definitely interested in seeing uh, the development and more research coming out and uh, just brassicas in general. It is, yeah, as you were saying, it's an interesting um, variety of plant that just has so many different variations that all stem from that, that wild mustard. So yeah, thank you guys for, for chatting it up a little bit. Appreciate it. And awesome. Johnny, what, what kind of, uh, mad science experiments are you doing right now and joe as well oh i just uh i just uh lately i've been doing some imo piles and uh been making lots of uh fennel fpj which is one of my favorites personally it works great for the plants but it's it's delicious it works good for for uh ice cream topping and all sorts of stuff and yeah i'm just making lots of imo and getting my uh my yard ready for the for the planting this in a couple of weeks here actually hey super cool johnny i'm, I'm dealing with the the not so fun side of farming but yet the exciting side where uh we're in escrow right now we're looking at taking over a what was formerly a certified organic aquaponic farm uh, so that also has a GAP certified processing center. So we're going through the, the sort of the in-between time. Now we're, we're not actually on there, but we're working on uh, developing the final uh, agreements in terms of how we set up a farm and how we function. But our plan is to be able to revive uh, the soil in this area, maybe use some components of the aquaponics system. Uh, that There are fish tanks on site. Our plan isn't to go full aquaponics, but indeed to use the Korean natural farming tools and techniques with whatever we grow there. So uh, hopefully we'll have uh, some more exciting news next time we talk story. We can let you know about our progress in, in this new location. Oh, Joe, I'm so excited for you. Uh, which which farm is it? And and we definitely need to talk more because the the missing piece of the puzzle in aquaponics, at least from what I've seen, is the removal of suspended solids in the water column. Um, so when you have an incredible buildup of, of um, turbidity 
So that's particulate suspended in water. Um, you lower the dissolved oxygen. You put stresses on the, the fish so that they're not as vibrant. Um, when, I've, when I've gotten to that sweet spot, my water has this amber color to it and the fish are flying around the tank. They're so just happy and they come up and look at you and they crash the food. Um, and I've been able to achieve that with, with a, what's called radial flow solid separator. And I'll be more than happy to explain it to you. Um, and then you can take those solids that come out of that, aerobically stabilize them, grow them out and, and just absolutely bust the soil up crazy uh, with, with those micro or aquatic microorganisms. So we will have a further conversation, my friend, and congratulations. And uh, I'm counting on you to get that all done and wrapped up, my friend. Well done. Well done. Uh, so we have Thomas back up. Thomas, what can, uh, do you have a question? Please uh, introduce yourself. No, I don't. I just came back to listen to you guys. Thank you. Too. Okay, great. Um, Johnny, yeah, that's uh, good for you, my friend. Uh, I'm always interested in these different types of um, – FPJs and the, the power of these different plants. Um, you know, each one is unique and individual and provides a different, you know, volatile compounds uh, or volatile organic compounds like terpenes and smells, um, but flavors as well. So um, kudos to you. And uh, yeah, spring is here and best of luck in, in this season coming up and, you know, rock on brother and, and get the word out. Thank you so much for coming up. So we're and, at the. Oh, oh yeah, and, and if anyone is listening who uh, maybe is a bit younger, kind of at the point where they're not sure what to do with their career life, or interested in science, um, one thing I think is desperately needed um, is people to start doing science on these regenerative processes. Um, you know, there's all this amazing anecdote for a wa such a wide variety of growers that are doing living soil, soil food web, natural farming, biodynamic, you name it, but kind of having processes that document. And this is the one thing where for what's desperately needed for us to have standpoints to not so much go against, but examples to provide against conventional methods. Because, you know, when a push comes to shove, most procedures rely upon the reductionist models of documentation, recording, reiteration, uh, and it's just currently how this is our society, the structures that be evaluate and understand. Um, you know, it's, 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 I think in general, it's, 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 it's a blessing and a curse. We've unlocked a huge amount of knowledge of the species through these processes, but kind of at the, at, at kind of right now at this point, we have the ability to interconnect and access the widest amount of information ever possible. It's, it, it acquires a great deal of focus and attention, right? There's a lot of information out there. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's fluff, but also a lot of things. And I, it's something that I think for a long time, I found myself like, am I on the right mountain, right? Am I climbing the right mountain? And that's something too, I think a lot of people kind of in the region and kind of come together why there's such, like why, why there's such affirming and such exhilarating connections because you're, see, you're searching, searching for this deeper meaning to understand the orchestra of nature. But I think definitely with natural farming, I know, I think Joe can mention probably uh, there's been a fair bit of work done academically in Hawaii and evaluating, but I think on the mainland, there's a huge amount of opportunity, especially people that are considered uh, doing work or even collaborating with your local extension or people, agronomy students. There are people that are graduate students that need novel research to investigate. And that's one of the big things when someone signs on for a PhD, it's not just about like qualifying, taking exams and getting papers. It's about literally contributing something novel to science. And I think there's a great opportunity to do that by, you know, if you're not in school right now or considering, but if you're a grower making those connections, because there's a lot of huge opportunities and even potentially money with a lot of these organic transition programs, you know, it takes about three years to transition from conventional to organic. But the cost, if you're going to be buying conventional organic inputs, you got a hole in your pocket. Most of them don't make it. Um, so I think with natural farming, a lot of these biocentric approaches, this is possible. And I think the way we spread this is by basically getting the attention of the people that care about these transitions. 
Um, currently, the people have the best documentation, the best lawyers, the best act together to function in this bureaucracy of how our agriculture system works are people that have conventional and synthetic methods employed. Oh, that was beautiful, Craig. Uh, this has been a dream of, of Craig Leaf and I for a while, and that is to uh, bridge the gap between East and West, between reductionist science and anecdotal field conditions. Um, you know, I'm, I am not a college graduate. I, they basically, you know, passed me through high school because I asked too many questions and they didn't want me coming back again. Um, so I pushed um, on a level of field conditions. Like I want to see reaction. I want to see soil structure. I want to see plant reaction, but I don't always have the science, the reductionist approach to, well, how do I repeat this? And, and this is the key, right? You know, this is why I started the Regen conference with Joshua four years ago was like, all right, you guys, you, you know what you're doing, but you can't repeat it. And that's the problem. In order for me to teach, I need to be able to repeat this over and over and over again. And that, that is the missing, that's the void. That's the gap between science and, and what's really happening in the field. The scientific approach is, well, we could do it in a lab. Cool. Then we've proven it. Well, no, nature's evolving. Nature's in succession. Nature is always in flux. So it's very difficult to prove out what you can in a lab in a controlled environment in a completely chaotic and uncontrolled environment. So this, this bridging of, of, the, of the field work with the reductionist scientific fact proving replicating ability of, of the educational or university, university system would be freaking huge. It's, it's like my love, Pauline, who's, who's staying in the allopathic, the, the Eastern medicine or Western medicine system while she's taking all natural herbs, refused cannabis and suffered stage four ovarian cancer, which is a fucking death sentence. All she did was, was, was take cannabis and high doses and, and get hook up with an herbologist and target her specific cancer, her specific endocannabinoid system. And, and all of the information we know about each and every one of these different herbs and their medicinal purposes. So to be able to do this um, with, with agriculture, it's always been my dream. I mean, every conference, every time I ever speak, I pray the cannabis plant, which is the most studied plant on the planet in all ever human history, is the bridge that breaks down the barriers between synthetic traditional ag and regenerative organic practices and i truly believe that she has the power to do that and hopefully you know as as time progresses the stigmatism the the the, the programming of how bad cannabis is and gateway drug and all this other shit man we all have endocannabinoid systems we never would have evolved to this point if we weren't supposed to be consuming thc and cbd in responsible doses i mean it used to be consumed by our animals. We used to consume the animals and we used to have it as plants uh, and, and, and we mixed it in with herbs. It's been used forever. And then all of a sudden the, the system took hold and took it away from us. And so in many ways, I hope she's the, she's the end all answer to take back the power of, of the system that the biosphere actually is. Uh, and, and awake enough humans to, to a point where we say, you know what, enough is enough. I'm going to take back my power. I'm going to take back my responsibility. I'm not going to listen to the doctor and take that pill. I'm going to do the research. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to do the hard work and understanding what's going on with my body, what my problems are, and where my, where my system has broken down. Not just treating a symptom, but dealing with the root cause. And so, yeah, you know, Johnny, guys like you are critical for the future in, in trying to connect with, with these kids who want to do good work and, and, and replicate what's happening in these regenerative, biodynamic, organic systems and why it's working so well. So it's, it's six o'clock. Uh, that was a real great, powerful ending. Um, I really want to thank the audience and everybody that participated and joined us tonight. 
Um, you know, we, we really enjoy this. We'll be back every Thursday from four to six uh, Pacific Standard Time. So please spread the word and join us. And uh, we look forward to next session. So Craig, uh, would you like to say any goodbyes? Yeah, definitely. I hope, I hope everyone's enjoyed and had a wonderful evening. Uh, I'm in New York and it was beautiful and sunny outside today. I'm pretty stoked after the better part of a year and change, kind of being an armchair jockey reading. I'm outside building composting setups and soaking in the sunshine. So I hope everyone's there too. get out. Get some of that vitamin D. Well, you know, get to get some sunlight so you can synthesize the vitamin D. You know, I'm sure someone could make a dick joke out of that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> definitely um, wonderful to be here and uh, stoked to have this awesome community, both on uh, any variety of social media platforms we may find ourselves. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And Peter, were there any last words from you, my friend? I I'm ready to go eat dinner. So no last words. From me. <laughs> All right. I, I guess day. we'll count. I guess we'll count it down from 10 all in the room. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Later. Good night. All right. That was, uh, anyway, have a good night. Uh, <laughs> I was having fun with the grubs that I found in the, uh, compost pile. Uh, I was going to do so, so it, hold on, let me bear with me for one second while I get rid of the earbuds. But, uh, so I think it's interesting, like, you know, things that in small quantities are okay in your garden and as they... Alex Hardy, how are you doing? I think you and Craig could chop it up. Um, but like those grubs, you know, I, I feel like if there aren't a lot of them, they're probably decomposers, but if they get out of control, they're probably damaging your plant. So I was going to talk with uh, Family Tree Seeds Tyler uh, just about kind of it's like shit you find, you know, I'm in SoCal, so it's like what bugs are out right now. The caterpillar are coming. Uh, yeah, no, she, my wife does, definitely does not know that the, uh, <laughs> I mean, these things are, hold on. <laughs> They're sizable. I mean, they're like, a, it's like chopping a finger off, like this dude. Yeah, the wife, the wife would not be happy if she knew the weed and the bugs I had in the house. But anyway, everyone have a good night. <laughs> A couple robins to eat the, uh, I mean, I feel like a robin would choke on those things. Yeah, Cafe Bustella is my go-to cheap coffee. And then uh, Don, if he's in the room or you know, they've been sending me the good Hawaiian coffee, which uh, I've been grinding up the beans. So, anywho. Uh, yeah, I mean, the things are like the size of a, yeah, no, G Gemma, Gemma is good at, uh, finding the caterpillar. Ah, Steve, I am very excited for that. I don't know what part of the world it's coming from. Yes, I do need some good main beer. I have right over there, a fridge full of West Coast. Actually, hold on. What am I drinking right now? It's a double jack, double IPA. So anywho, we are shockingly with my Chinese wife eating Chinese foods. 
<laughs> tonight after Chinese food last night and quite possibly Chinese food <laughs> the night before. It's it's a minor miracle when I get to slide my Italian food in. So tonight we got Chinese food on the menu. <laughs> All right, well, have a good night. Uh, yeah, I don't think I'll be back later tonight, but uh, <laughs> God, I hope not. Anyway. Chad Westport. So I can't drop the surprise, but I possibly have a very cool surprise related to Can You Hear Me? Uh, oh, and Chad, we have, um, <laughs> since you're here with me, uh, are you cool with some people who want to show their home grows uh, coming on the home grow show and... We could have like the the viewer segment or something. <laughs> I can hear you. Stony Scott, yes, Steve, we can. Uh, let me Google it so I can uh, see. This is Steve's friend who is killed. And, and crazily, uh, there was a horrific car accident today uh, that when I was bringing Gemma to the, uh, I mean, literally on Santa Monica Boulevard, like a regular street, one car blew through the stop sign and uh, literally flipped over the, it, it you know, T-boned the other car. So this is Steve's friend. Anyone wants to donate to that? Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I was literally looking like I actually went past the dentist and then realized that it was on the right side of the street versus the left side. So I like made a U-turn and came back. And as I was driving back, um, actually, you know what I can do, Steve? Let me, um, Literally, I heard a screech and I looked in my rear view mirror and a car hit another car, flipped the other car over. Uh, wait, hold on one second. And then I gotta go before I get yelled at for, uh, where are you? Okay, so this is, looks like a super sweet, nice guy. Um, let me kill that, uh, I mean, I think the car going through the, I think it was going pretty fast, <laughs> Brandon, you're two hours and 10 minutes late to the conversation. We're, we're wrapping it up, but Canacon, Oklahoma city is around the corner. Is Brandon going to be there? Is Steve going to be there? Because I think we're going to be there. Although I still haven't heard back from the people who run Canacon. So anyway, but yeah, I think... Uh, the uh oh brandon you definitely need to come if you don't know about it uh hold on uh canacon okc 2021 uh all right hold on south that's not oh wait yeah that is the one uh why is that called canacon south though Uh, South OKC. Okay, here we go. So, there we go. This is May 28th at the exciting Oklahoma City Convention Center. So anyway, that's uh, 
is there like a... Yeah, anyway. I'm working on that. Okay, Steve's gonna be there. Is brand no, it's not November, it's uh next month. It's uh May twenty uh all right, I don't know that's a I hate yeah, here we go. May well all right. May twenty seventh and May twenty eighth. Um who else is in driving distance of but where's the November one? Is that also in Oakland? Is that a Canacon in no in uh Steve, how far from Oklahoma City are you? And Charles Freeman, where are you guys like Yeah, so you should definitely go. But what's the one you're talking about in November? Is that also a Canacon? Coxarian. Okay, I hear my wife upstairs. So there's about one minute till I get yelled at. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, next month. Whoever's in that area, let's scheme. Myriad Botanical Gardens. I don't know where that is. Yeah, just uh, Google Canacon, Oklahoma. All right. I am out. So everyone have a good night. And uh, Cheddar Bob is lobster on the menu tonight. Yes. <laughs> Life is about playing defense against uh, the unhappy wife because then, then life's not so good. So, all right, have a good one. Johnny or John Gorski, I'm happy about that. <laughs> it's always a relief when shit arrives and lobster. Yeah, I wish Cheddar Bob had a more New Englandy accent, but... Sadly, he does not. He's not blessed with the South Shore Rhode Island accent. So anyway, all right. Have a good night.